the shooting range. In this episode, Giuseppe Gabrielli versus the world. The story of the G56. How to play on machines with really big guns. Hotline. The developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with getting to know a certain British gentleman. The Conqueror is a well-known and respected death machine among the players of War Thunder. And not for nothing. This heavy tank is able to withstand a lot of hits without any harm, and then respond with such a powerful blast that will take out even the most protected targets. In the update 1.79, this tank received additional protection weighing an entire ton, and it's a good reason to get to know it better. The battle rating of a tank depends on the mode you choose. In RB, 7.3. In Arcade 7.7. .7. In both, the main purpose of this machine is fighting on the front line, and this handsome gentleman is quite suited to the task. For example, the upper glazy plate combined with the additional ballistic protection package reaches an impressive value of 165 millimeters at a constructional armor slope angle of 60 degrees. As a result, depending on the type of projectiles, it can withstand from 350 to 380 millimeters of piercing damage. The lower glacy plate is thinner as usual, only 117 millimeters of effective thickness. But the turret, <laughs> it's fantastic, from 600 to 900 millimeters of effective thickness, depending on the type of enemy shells. Basically, this can be the end of the story. Just take this vehicle, rush to the points, catch some shots, and be as cool as they come. But if you are still with us, let's talk about the gun. The caring designers added an excellent 120mm cannon with two types of shells. An APDS L1G piercing 360mm at 100m and a Hesh L1TK going through 152 millimeters of armor at any distance. Also, the engineers added a stabilizer to the gun. Unfortunately, the turret rotation speed and the elevation angles are far from great. They are 19.2 degrees per second and from minus 7 to plus 15 degrees, and the reload rate is almost 15 seconds. Turns out that the tank can survive, but destroying loads of enemies at once, eh, not very much. Still, the Conqueror accelerates quite quickly to 34 and 37 kph in realistic and arcade battles, respectively. The reverse speed is also not bad, 12 km per hour, a decent result for a 66-ton monster. As for the survivability, on the one hand, there are four crew members in the vehicle, but on the other hand, look in the X-ray mode. The shells are literally everywhere. One successful penetration and the machine is destroyed. But don't get upset. Firstly, you can reduce the number of shells to 15. Secondly, not every tank can even pierce you. And thirdly, you have 12 smoke grenades that shoot out in a couple of moments in a single blast. Lastly, let's talk about the combat use. In the case of the Conqueror, there is no difference between the AB and the RB modes. At the beginning of the battle, you can safely go and meet the enemy face to face. All the rest is just a choice of direction. Storming the enemy point or protecting your own? Easy. Cleaning a city street of opponents? No problem. Alternatively, you can just take a valuable position and then play using your turret. Just remember about your vulnerable sides and the long reload rate.
It's been a while since we last talked about the Italian aircraft designers. Today, we remember one of the best fighters by Giuseppe Gabrielli. When the time came to share the technology of the DB605 engine with Italy, the Germans decided to cheat and shared the documentation with Fiat and not with Alfa Romeo, that already were producing the licensed DB601. Why did this happen? Apparently, Marsi were to blame and personally, the genius Mario Castoldi, who shared not only the influential Italian competitors from Fiat and Reggiani, but also Willy Messerschmitt himself, and that man wouldn't forgive such an insult. He longed to force Italy to take the German aircraft into service and get revenge on their talented Italian colleagues. So Mario Castoldi was ordered to lose by installing the DB605 on the Veltro. Reggiani, with their projects, couldn't compete with Messerschmitt. The planes by Longhi and Alessi were too complicated to produce. As for Fiat, the Germans were sure that even the newest DB605, the young chief aircraft designer Giuseppe Gabrielli wouldn't be able to devise anything against the already flying BF109 Gustav. But the plans of the Germans collapsed. The G55 created by Gabrielli was recognized as the best Italian fighter on the tests in Rechlin. Moreover, even German pilots liked it for the easy takeoff and landings. And no wonder! The BF109 was created during the mid-30s, and from modification to modification, its mass grew, and it was impossible to fundamentally redesign the weak chassis. One would need to create a new aircraft instead. As a result, the BF-109 Emil had serious problems with takeoff and landing, and the Gustavs became a real catastrophe. After the war, one of the leading German aces, Johann Steinhoff, confessed that every third Gustav was lost as a result of an accident or crash during takeoff or landing. And then the DB603 engine arrived, even heavier and more powerful and it was impossible to install it on the BF-109. Willy Messerschmitt urgently tried to create Messerschmitt 209, but it was too late. Now Kurt Tank and his Fokker Wolves were ahead as well. As for Giuseppe Gabrielli, he didn't care about Messerschmitt's games in the slightest. What he did care about was the fate of Italy, which was losing the war spectacularly. His home, Sicily, had already been captured by the American forces, and the Fiat factories in Turin were leveled to the ground by the flying fortresses. Having received documentation on the new DB603 in these conditions, the chief aircraft designer of Fiat simply installed this engine on the G55 and switched the name to the G56. He only needed to extend the bonnet by 8 centimeters and install a more powerful radiator. That's it. The plane was ready to fly. But they only managed to assemble a couple of prototypes. There was simply nowhere to build the new fighters, and the Germans, who were still controlling northern Italy, ordered the project to be cancelled. All the DB603 engines went to the Fokker Wolf factories and Gabrielli remained empty-handed. But only until the end of the war. After it finished, Fiat got a tsunami of orders for the brand new Gabrielli fighters. And this, despite the fact that the Allied planes were going to the third world countries at almost the price of scrap metal, or were just destroyed, there were too many of them. The famous Spitfires and Mustangs lost contests in Egypt and Argentina. These countries were ready to pay full price for the Fiat fighters only, and of course, the Italian Air Force preferred domestic aircraft as well. True, 
It was impossible to build the G56 around the DB603 anymore, as there were no engines left. But there were countless Merlins still ready to go. So what prevented Gabrielli from remotorizing his fighter again? <laughs> Nothing. He did just that. But this plane is not yet in War Thunder, so we'll wait with the story about it. Do you like big guns? If so, this next part of the show is just for you. First, let's determine at which point a gun is considered a heavy caliber one. As usual, everything is relative. For example, a large caliber rifle has a barrel from 9 to 20 millimeters wide. Everything wider has a weapon system so cumbersome that it is better to call it small caliber cannon. And in the cannon area, we find monsters of 200, 400, even 600 millimeters. But today, we're talking about tank weapons, so the term heavy caliber begins somewhere between 120 and 183 millimeters. Everything we say here is relevant for most machines except for the MBTs. By the time these tanks were created, the standard values shifted and became between 105 and 152 millimeters. The very first encounter with high caliber guns awaits the players on the very first tier. Here we have the German Sturmpanzer II and the Japanese Horo with huge 150 mm howitzers. Nobody can survive a hit from those. Though their ballistics require some getting used to, as well as the 122 mm howitzer, the M30 from the Soviet Su-122 that resides on Tier 2. It has three types of shells. A reload rate of almost 20 seconds against 8 or 9 among the other machines on this tier. Good agility <laughs> and yeah, devastating firepower. One shot and the King Tiger loses a turret. On Tier 3 we can see more of these vehicles. The USSR presents the KV-2, the SU-100Y and the SU-152 and Germany has the Sture Emil and the Brumbier. By Tier 4, the fans of the big guns get a real treat from the Soviets. The ISU-122-152, the KV-2 and the T-44-122. The IS-2, the IS-6 and the SU-122P. And what about the other nations? Just an American T-34 with a 120mm weapon and an English FV-4005 with the 183mm one. <laughs> Not much. The other countries wake up by Tier 5. The English roll out the Centurion AVRE, the Conway and the Conqueror. The Americans answer with the M103. The Germans present the Jagdtiger and the Maus and the Soviets come up with the IS-3 and 4. And we're not talking about Object 268, the SU-122-54 and Object 120. These machines come from a different generation. As you can see, there are plenty of machines with heavy caliber guns in the game and all of them, albeit very different, have several similar characteristics. For starters, it's the ammunition. On the one hand, the shots for these machines are huge and only few can take more than 30 shells into battle. In addition, the large shells occupy almost the entire space inside, thus making the tank extremely vulnerable. Hence, it is necessary to reduce the ammunition to no more than 15 shells or so. Then, another problem arises. When you only have 15 shots or even fewer, you need to aim extremely carefully. Misses are unacceptable. And it's not just about the quantity of the shells, but about the reload rate, which lasts 20 to 30 seconds on average. 
The stakes on these machines are very high. You will hardly be allowed to reload. By the way, with such a weapon, one can also think about using high explosive shells. The main thing to remember is that you probably won't get a second chance. So, if you're going to shoot one of these, make sure that you absolutely will definitely penetrate the enemy. In addition, do not forget about the ballistics, especially on machines like the KV-2 or the Su-152. They aren't even tank guns. They're actually howitzers. Therefore, before fighting real players, be sure to practice in the custom battles or the test drive. If you can't get it right, try using these machines in arcade battles. You'll get some automatic help there. Get used to the trajectories of the shells and when you're ready, come back to the RB. The last common thing between all these monsters is that almost all of them can't drive very fast, which means that it won't be possible to quickly hide from the enemy fire. And you might say, why do you need these machines if they have so many flaws? The only answer here is crazy firepower. These tanks basically never even heard that the enemy could have some armor. They just pierce everything they fire at. And the behind armor effect of these beauties is just incredible. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. The first question comes from a user called Dabulo Pub. Will the War Thunder ever have controllable humans? Hi mate, that's a no. If you want some controllable humans action, try another project of ours. It's called Enlisted. Or just, well, I don't know, invent a mind controlling device. Joseph2000 writes, Will Italian tanks be released in the same way the Japanese and British tanks were? Sometime around Christmas? Hi there, Joseph. Can't really tell you the specific date, but we're still planning on releasing those Italian war machines before the end of the year. Another question today was sent by Mr. Brian Brush. Can you guys go back instead of forward in history? Hi mate, that would also be a no. It's far more interesting to add new features, technologies and powerful weapons than adding some primitive tech around BR 0.1 that should even be less powerful than the reserve machines. Don't you agree? Then there was this very serious opinion from Spino Gaming 56. It's funny really how far we've came and still measuring in horses how they do test that strap one horse and if one don't work get another one until they get the even amount of power. Can't wait till Xbox. Wow. That last part of the message came pretty unexpectedly, didn't it? Well, that's it for today. But feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range. <laughs>